it looks like it's that time and then some. Okay, I checked down at my watch. I thought I had another three or four minutes to get all this stuff attached and so start teaching this class. We're studying the book of Psalms. We have those who are visiting with us and we're glad that you're here today, but we're just trying to make it through the book of Psalms in nine sessions. And uh, there are 150 chapters in Psalms, and I think we made it through nine of those chapters. And so, uh, uh, but I have sort of worked out a way, I think that will, I hope it'll be helpful, and that is to spend 10 or 15 minutes each week in an introductory way, and then just to turn through the Psalms and find verses that I like. Is that okay? I don't know if that, you know, verses that, that I've got underlined in my Bible that at some time, some point in my life really, really meant a lot to me. I think, for example, um, one of those verses is found in the, the, uh, 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 in, in the last verse of chapter 4. I think, Andy, you read it yesterday or last Sunday. And uh, that is, I will lay me down in peace and sleep for thou, Lord, makest me, uh, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. And you know why that verse is important? Uh, uh, old Brother Franklin Camp. Now, I'm Old Brother Dan Jenkins, so you can imagine how anciently old Old Brother Franklin Camp was. But he said, when I had open heart surgery and I kissed my family goodbye, it was real serious. And you, you knew Franklin. That, uh, um, and... Uh, uh, he said, I thought I may never see them again, pretty serious heart surgery and everything, and said, I kissed them goodbye and headed for the operating room, and I never had one moment of anxiety. From the time I left that room, the whole time I was in the surgery, in the recovery room, because I kept saying this verse, I will lay me down in sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell safely. And it's verses like that it's what we're trying to do in this class. It's not to intellectually talk about all the different natures of the Psalms that are here, but to try to help find those Psalms that will help you live. And you stop and think about it. Psalm 1, verse 2 says he meditates on the law of the Lord. What's he meditate? He thinks about it. He doesn't just read it. i got to read three chapters of the Bible today and five on Sunday. In a year's time, I'll read the Bible through. Well, wonderful. What would you read? I don't know, but I read the Bible through, you know. That, uh, uh, that's not what it's all about. And I feel that way about the book of Psalms. That if, if, if I could get you to write down in your heart verses that you could use, and it may be some that you've used for years, or it may be some that are introduced to you as we go through this study. Now let's do, let's spend about 10 minutes or so just talking about Psalms in general. I want you to think about how many of the Psalms have application to Jesus. Now they're written after, uh, uh, you know, uh, David did not have access to these Psalms until he wrote them. But every one of these psalms, as I begin thinking about what makes Jesus what he is. Well, he's the son of God, yeah. But well, what makes David the way he is? I think it is right here in this book. Now, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Isn't that amazing? Let the words of my mouth, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How can we be like David? When I was a child and read that verse in the Bible that says, be perfect like God is part perfect, I thought I quit. You know, I mean, that's when I first read that, when not understanding what the word perfect mean, means, as me, being complete. And I thought, there's no way. You know, I've messed it up already, you know, today. And, and, and so you've got, you've, you've got those verses that are there. Uh, but can I be like David? Think of the mistakes he made in his life, but more importantly, think of the adversity that he went through. And one of the Psalms that we're going to look at today, and we're not going to start there, but one of the Psalms we're going to look at today is, is the Psalm that you may, you may want to use for a communion meditation, uh, if that makes sense. I want us to continue. We got through Psalms 9 last time, and we're cutting this first section a few minutes short. I want us to look at Psalms 15. 
Are you acquainted with the psalm that asks the question, Who may abide in your tabernacle? That's a good question, isn't it? Here's David, a man after God's own heart. And he says, Lord, who is that individual that can live in your tabernacle? And that's figurative language. Because, uh, you know, they had the tabernacle. They did not yet have the temple. But it was not a place. They didn't go to church. When they, when they went to the tabernacle, when they went to the temple, they didn't go to church. We've got such a wrong concept about what, uh, uh, what tabernacle temple was like. But he says, who can have this relationship? Who can abide in your tent? And probably does not at all have reference uh, specifically to the tabernacle itself. But who can abide in your house? Who is that individual whose nature is such that he can abide in your house? Who may dwell in your holy hill? You know, you, yeah, isn't that amazing? Henry, that's, isn't that a great question? I mean, this is the heart of it. David, tell me, tell me four, five, six qualities that I need to have in my life. Now, you want to make this practical? As we look at these things, think about which one do I need to work on? Now, if your answer is all of them, then you probably need to uh, spend more time meditating on the law of the Lord. I'm not sure exactly how to how to say that. But look at it. Who is that man that can abide? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach, gossip, against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is not despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, understanding charging exorbitant amounts, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. And then this psalm, then closing, he who does these things shall never be moved. I think it's amazing the interaction that is in this verse with other people. Doing right. There's a rule in life that will really help you. You may have never heard it. But if I were you, I would try to live my life by this, by this rule. It's always right to do right. And it's always wrong to do wrong. You gotta make gotta make a decision. You're trying to figure out how to live your life or how to deal with some people around you that are just as awkward. You're trying to uh, figure out how you deal with, uh, uh, with family members. Do right. It's always right to do right. It's always wrong to do wrong. It's never right to do wrong and it's never wrong to do right you see the whole world in America lives on the principles of situation ethics well I know the I know God said that but I can do you know I was in that situation and, and I tell you, it, it just came up and I didn't even think I, I said it before I thought you no know, you know, it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And if you've got garbage coming out of your mouth, you've got garbage in your heart. You, you understand that. A vile person talks about filthy and vile things, and we think a righteous person doesn't talk at all. No, no. If, if, if the Word of God's hidden in your heart, it's got, it, it's got to come out. And I just spoke before, I just, no, no, no. The rule is do right. 
Walk uprightly and work righteousness. And then this concept of a vile person not being condemned. One of the problems that sometimes we face is we don't want people that are not nice to be in the church. <laughs> you, you understand what I mean? The old man walked into the building and uh, he's in tattered clothes and everything. And uh, they said, don't sit here. Go, go sit in a lesser place. You know what James says? James says, if a man comes to you in, in, in clothes that are not so nice, you say, sit over here. I love the King James in view of the way our language means this change. The King James says, and if he walks in in gay clothing, you know, walks in the finest, well, 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 I'm really glad to have you here today. We ought to be as thankful to have people that are coming in this place whose lives are troubled. It's not a sanctuary for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And I grew up in the church when we lived on, and many of you did, churches on the other side of the railroad track. You know what I'm talking about? If you're old in the church, you'll understand that. That's, uh, that's uh, congregations we, we grew up in. I, get, I don't know what it was like on the other side, the rich side of the railroad track, but we're on the other side. You know, uh, and uh, a lot of folks walked to church and didn't have cars and don't say no because car hadn't been invented. They were riding their horses. No, it, it's not that far back. But a vile person is not condemned. You know, we want, we want people in this church that are sort of just like us. We want the church to have a real nice appearance. The question is, who does Jesus want in this building? Isn't that amazing? And if he let us in, and you said it just right, if he let us in, then there's room here for everybody. And we've got to get that in our heads. Uh, the old gentleman walked in one time and sat down in the pew, and the preacher started preaching. He started saying, amen, amen. Henry, you like this old man? He comes in, he says, amen, amen. And somebody walked up there and said, sir, what are you doing? He said, I'm worshiping God. And they said, that's not allowed in this building. <laughs> and and I, I don't, I, but that's sort of typical sometimes. Everything, everything's just got to be picture perfect and everything. Well, it needs to be. I'm not mocking. The value, I'm glad you wear the best that you have to worship God. I'm glad that, that you dress up to come to a place like this and that you're not... Uh, you know, that, that you're not trying to dress down to go to church. Uh, you understand what I mean? Church in Nashville, Tennessee, way, way back yonder, four, 50 years ago when I was a student there, they did away with all the pu Young people did it. I don't know. Now, those young people are grandparents, great-grandparents now. But, I mean, they took all the pews out of the building, got in the building, they sat on the floor. They thought they'd live closer to God if in the hippie age if we'd just get rid of all these pews and all sit on the floor. And they, the amazing thing is, those young people, some were students, uh, had been students at Lipscomb, would go to work dressed in their suit and everything. On Wednesday night, they'd go home, put on their tattered jeans and their, and their hippie clothes so they could come to worship God. I'm glad you're not wearing tattered jeans. Unless that's the best you've got, I'm glad you're wearing them if that's the best you've got. Do you understand what I'm saying? Henry, what do you want to say? That's right. And you're right. I mean, Henry was just saying, David always gave his best to God, and, and he really did. In fact, he had one sacrifice he was going to offer, and um, the man who uh, uh, said, here, I have all of these oxen, I have the wood for the sacrifice, use my wood and use my oxen to offer your sacrifice. And David said, I will not give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. See, that changes your heart. We'll be giving today. What are you going to give him? I hope you give to the Lord 
that which cost you something. It is a sacrifice of giving. And we got, we've got to understand that. Now then, I, 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 can't, I could spend so much more time here um, in this psalm, but, uh, but, but, but I really don't, don't, I really want to, but I don't want to. Let's go to Psalms 22. The psalm begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That ring a bell? On the cross, Jesus said these very words. Now, it's not that God just zapped him and put that in, in, into his head. And, you know, sometimes we think about, well, he was the son of God, and so he just, it was pretty easy for him to live righteous. The Bible said he was tempted in all points exactly like we are without sin. He was just as human as we are when it comes to the matter of temptation. But, but, and so God just didn't on the cross give him these words to say. These are words that, uh, that uh, uh, Jesus had memorized, and he thought, this fits my life. And so there was that time in David's life in which he felt he was absolutely abandoned. Now, as you read this psalm, you're going to go to the cross, and you need to go to the cross because it's, it's a prophetical messianic psalm. It starts with the very words that Jesus uttered on the cross. There are other verses here that are found that are quoted at least uh, referenced in the, in, in the biblical account of what happened at the crucifixion. But I want you to understand that a part of what made David what he was is the adversity he had to deal with in his life. But look at his faith. Faith. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? That's an amazing song. David struggled with his faith. You've got to understand that. I don't mean he was losing his faith. Psalm 73, he said, I was just about ready to lose my faith when I saw the wicked weren't suffering like I am. But David's in that situation in his life, and you can, you can pick that time and that situation, read the life of, uh, of David in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, and, and, and think of all that David endured. And it was that time when, when he says, where's God? Have you ever been there? Where's God when I need him so much? My God, my God. You want to look at every word in the Psalms? Not, oh God. My God. I have my groanings. And I have my God. And in the midst of those times whenever your life is just flipped upside down and you hardly know which way to turn, you need to understand that the emotions that you have are godly emotions in the sense that a man after God's own heart felt exactly the very thing, same thing you felt. You know, I mean, I was nigh unto losing my faith. I, you know, everything was going wrong. Medical situation, loved ones dying, divorce coming in, problems with parents, problems with, uh, uh, with, with children. My God, where are you? And so David cries out and, and, and says, God, where are you? Oh, my God, verse 2, I cry in the daytime, and you do not hear. And in the night season, and, and I'm not silent. I'm crying out to you, God, all, all day long, all night long. God, where are you? And then he says, when I think of my God, you are holy. You are enthroned in the praises of Israel. And I read the Bible, David says, Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted you, and you delivered them. 
They cried to you and you were delivered. They trusted in you and you were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lips. They shake their head. They say, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Obviously, those are words from the cross. But the words from the cross at the foot of the cross hurled at Jesus. You know, let's see if he can save himself. He saved others, let him save himself. He trusted in God, let God take care. He cries out, Eli, Eli. He's crying out to Elijah. No, he's saying, my God, my God. And I've read the Bible, David said. And when I read the Bible, I see how God used to do it. Is that our attitude? Moses knew a used to do God. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. I live in dead 400 years. At the burning bush, that's the way it used to be. No. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, I am your God too. And, 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 and if your concept is that God used to really help folks, He doesn't help them today. You, 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 you don't understand. And yet, this is where David is. David is really, really struggling. Something's happened in his life, and everybody around him is mocking. You know, the reason bad things happen in your life is because God's mad at you, and God's punishing you. It's wrong for us to think if there's adversity in our life, it's because of something wrong that we have done. We live in a world full of, of, of that which is wrong and that which is evil and that which is vile. Treat you. And the consequence of Adam and Eve's sins in the garden when God cursed this world is going to bring death and, 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 and sorrow and grief. It's going to happen. It happens to everybody. But David said, where's God when you need him? It's exactly where he was when you had good things happening in your life and you were not thanking God for the good things. Thanksgiving, 28 days of praying this month, and one of those things was thank God for daily blessings, blessings you receive every day. I love Henry Bass when he prays one little phrase in this church. You remember what he, he begins his prayers? God, we thank you that you woke us up this morning. I love that. That's just fresh and aren't you glad to be alive? And, and God's the same place he was in the midst of adversity that he was when everything was going wonderful and which things, which things were great. But, 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 but here, is this, here is this psalm and, and, and David is, is crying out to God. Uh, you know, they, well, Verse 9, you are he who took me out of the womb. Who was in the womb? It says something about abortion, by the way, this very verse. The me that came out of the womb was the me that was in the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast out from you upon, I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You've been my God. Be not far away, for trouble is near and there's none to help. Bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan. 
They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I'm poured out, my, out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it's melted. My strength is dried up like a piece of broken pottery. My tongue clings to my jaws. You brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I, count, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments, and for my clothing they cast lots. You see all that messianic stuff? You see the cross there, gambling for his clothes, the dog, the, 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 the uh, strong bulls and everything, and, and the, um, the lions that are there. We don't really understand what a strong bull is. I don't know about you, Henry. I don't know if you had a bull out in the back pasture and your mom and daddy said, don't get on that pasture where that bull is. You know, I mean, he was running from the bull and he saw that limb of the tree and he jumped up to catch that limb. He missed it, but he caught it on his way back down. And so he was, he, you know, he, he was saved. Uh, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Lions, by the way, think of water buffalo. Think of those African water buffaloes. They're almost the king of the jungles. Those water buffalo, Google it, the water buffalo in, uh, uh, in, in Africa are so ferocious. And when I say Google it, I need to correct something I said last week. I talked about congressmen making 179,000 or 279,000, and uh, someone Googled it and said, Dan, you're wrong about that. And I thank that person for Googling it because I was wrong about it. Now, I got it from a guy who had served on the, in, in the House, on, uh, on, on, served one of, the, one of the senators, I guess it was in the, uh, uh, in the Senate. And he said, that's the rule. It's not the rule. Don't want to spread wrong information. But those water buffalo in Africa, they're ferocious. And lions that are there. Can you imagine? David, have you ever faced a lion? Yeah. When he killed Goliath, the lion and the bear. Evidently, those lions you read about in the Bible are not little mountain cats. That the lions that we see in Africa were really a part of Palestine back in that ancient time when that land flowed with milk and honey. And so you think of a lion. That's why we put them in cages. And David says, they're all the way around me. And so I think the point I'm trying to say David is not writing some prophetical psalm that has nothing to do with his life. This is exactly what David experienced. And that's why psalms is so important. It's the only, only book in the Bible where as you read the historical events about all of these characters, here is the one book of the Bible that David says, look, here's my heart. Here's, here's where I am. I'm going to open up my heart to you, and I'm going to show you the deep emotions that I have. And in your life, that's what you need to do, is to open up your heart and say, Lord, help me to be like David. And if you read the Psalms, it will change your life. When Josh and I were in Easter Island, there was a lady who's uh, been living with this man for 15 years and everything, and lo and behold, he'd gone back to uh, Chile and married a woman over there and abandoned this woman after 15 years, and she was just at her wit's end. How do you counsel somebody like that? We went over to her and said, Read the Psalms. We read some of the Psalms to her and suggested some Psalms that, 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 that she could read on her own. And we went back the next day and she said, you cannot imagine 
how much the reading of the Psalms helped me. Folks, read the Psalms. Now, the amazing thing is that at the end of every psalm, there is that blessing. Almost every psalm, there is that blessing. Verse 19, he says, You, O Lord, do not be far away. My strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog, save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. And then he says, you've answered me. That's the key point. Whenever those times in your life and you poured out your heart to God and said, what am I going to do about this situation? And then all of a sudden from out of the darkness, deliverance comes. That's the way we look at it. Out of the overflowing, the abundance of, the, of God keeping His promise that He'll work everything out for our good. You answered me. And that's why this month when we've been talking about Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. And if you will learn in your life, like David did, to look back at specific times in your life when there was no future, when you were helpless, Bill Ingram, I sit here thinking about some of the stories you've told of being over behind the Iron Curtain when the curtain was still there. Parachuting in, you know, jumping out of a plane at 25,000 feet and just using your body to fly over behind the Iron Curtain and land over there in the communist world, hide your parachute. Think of those times, Bill, where you saw at least one of your Fellow, fellow, fellow workers who'd gone in with you killed. And, and, and I think about that. And then I look not at Bill because those are some of the obvious ones. I look at every one of you in here. There have been times in your life where you were exactly at this point. You thought, I'm never going to make it. And then said, but God heard me. And David looked back at that day in which he was terrified when he was out there caring, taking care of those sheep. He looked back at that time when he was filled with terror. Can you imagine? He's a young boy when he fights Goliath. How much? And he was younger than that. Whenever that lion and that bear came upon David, he's out there taking care of the sheep. And a good shepherd lays down his life for his, for his sheep. And David took what he had in his hand, that rod, that slingshot, is probably a whole lot closer to that rod that he took, but you, let, you can let your imagination, let him use the slingshot if you like, and see that young boy terrified of that lion and terrified of that bear and worried about all that was going to happen to those sheep that were in his care, and he said, and God delivered me. Chuck and Chuck, firemen. There have been times in your life which those fires were around you. I'm going to make it. But you sit here. And it's David's experience of being in those kinds of situations. And we're talking, and when I talk about Bill and Chuck and Chuck, we're talking about physical things that were there. 
But when those problems came in your life that were not, not as obviously dangerous as fire or, 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 or gunshots and things of that nature, and God worked you through that, that's what David did. David not only read the Bible and said, the fathers trusted in you and you took care of them and, and I'm struggling with that. But the way you make it through life is you think, he walked me through this very adversity. Those of you who are widows. Betty, how long have you been a widow? How many? 13 years. Isn't that amazing? How long have you been a widow? 25 years, 30 years. And well, they said he's dead. June, you received that phone call. Bob had just... Uh, phoned you from docking the boat and said, I'll be home in a few minutes. A few minutes later, the phone rang and Bob had, elect had June's first husband, electrocuted himself, didn't come home. Peggy was 12 years of age. How are you going to make it? And every one of you have a story. And here's how David met it. He read the Bible, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and Jacob, I will be your God. That's the I am. And that's why when David cries out, my God, my God, that's not a different God. There's not a different God today than there was in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's not a different God now than there was in those ancient times. But what David did, David looked at his life and he said, God had to do that. There was no way on earth that that could have worked out. But it did. And David said, I thank you, Lord, because you answered me. Folks, let's be people who have faith in God. What happens? Verse 22. And I hope that you th understand how this applies to the re reason you're in this building right now. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Do you know that verse is in Hebrews 13? And it's applied to Jesus And Jesus said, in the midst of the church, I will sing praises to you. And when we sing these songs, he who was on the cross saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was on the, who was on the cross at that time is now in our assemblies. But have the heart of David when David said, Lord, you answered me in my and 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 I and, and I know you did it. You answered me. And the end result of that is I'm going to praise you. It's not checking a ticket that says, well, I gotta to go to church once every week. It's a heart that says, I want to I want to praise God. And if Jesus is in our assembly tonight, I will sing and praise God with Jesus tonight. It's amazing, isn't it? 
it, it, it's not, well, got to do a checklist, have to go at least once on Sunday. You don't have to listen. You don't really have to sing. You'd be critical of everything that goes on and, and, and all the rest. And David said, when this deliverance came, what'd you do, David, when that baby died? I prayed and prayed that the baby wouldn't die. For seven days I prayed, though God had said, that little baby's going to die. And I prayed and I prayed, God, please don't let my baby die. Perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps God will change his mind. And the baby died, and they were afraid to tell David the baby was dead. David figured out what all the whisper is all about, and he understood it. You know what David did? I've been there when parents saw their child die and fell out on that hospital floor screaming and banging their heads against the floor when their child died. And we've all been there when we had adversity. You know what David did? David got up, anointed himself, and went and worshiped God. You want to let the Psalms help you? We've made it through 22 Psalms. We're supposed to be through 40 Psalms in the things that I've got laid out. We're going to have to go a little bit faster. That's enough for today. You are dismissed.